to provide what is fundamentally a fraud anyway. The whole pretense of tax havens is a fraud, a pretense. And the arrangements are facilitated by these terribly respectable people. And, you know, I, I was asked on the BBC once who, who, what I thought, and who I thought were the four greatest threats to democracy worldwide. I don't know why somebody thought I was going to answer Iran, Iraq, North Korea, or whatever they were hoping. Because <laughs> I didn't. I actually said I thought the four greatest threats to democracy worldwide were called PricewaterhouseCoopers, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, and KPMG. And they were a little surprised. And this was live, which always helps. And uh, they said, why do you think that? I said, because those four organizations are in every major tax haven in the world. They are the one absolutely unifying feature. And the point about them is that they provide respectability and credibility to those good places. Without them, none of the world's multinational companies who need to be ordered there can be present in those places. And they set up structures to make sure that massive amounts of profit can be diverted into those places with the deliberate intention of ensuring that the governments of the popular states of the world, whether they be in Africa or Latin America or Europe or even in the USA, don't get that cash to fulfill their democratic mandate. So you ask me what's the biggest threat to democracy, removing the money owed to a democratic government seems to me to be the greatest threat to the fulfillment of its democratic mandate because it can't fulfill the promise to the electorate and therefore you're undermining the whole process. That's why these people are actually key to this problem. I was trained by KPMG. They're always really annoyed when I'm referred to an ex-KPMG person. It's 30 years ago I left, but I still have. Um, and we began to take on these very powerful bodies as a result, with the aim of challenging this structure. And, mysteriously, it seems to have happened. Of course, we couldn't have anticipated a global worldwide financial crash. Now, some of my other work has been involved with that, with the Green New Deal and various other things, and I've written on economics. This book is not about tax havens at all. That's about my view of economics, which is very... Um, I mean, it's much more the sort of thing that's being picked up on banking and so on by Occupy and so on. Um, and it's quite a radical view of economics, I hope. Um, it's macroeconomics in the sense that I'd always hoped the New Economics Foundation would write it, but never did. Um, whereas NEF remains more micro-focused by and large. And I was in the New Economics Foundation this afternoon. Um, that's why I was slightly late in my meeting at New Economics right around this afternoon. I've been involved with the New Economics Foundation since the first ever meeting of the New Economics Foundation in 1985. Um, so I've been around this scene for a while. But we had the major global economic crisis. <coughs> what did that do? Despite every myth that you are told that the Labour government from 1997 to 2007 massively overspent, let me tell you one simple, very straightforward fact. It ran a surplus on current account. It got more tax in by some way than all its spending to meet all its day-to-day -day obligations. It also paid for half of its investment out of current income during that period. And the 200 billion it borrowed was to pay for schools and hospitals and other things which had not been invested in in the period from 1979 to 1997, where there was a massive backlog of investment. So actually, it didn't borrow recklessly at all. I'm not a member of the Labour Party. I speak to them quite often, but I also speak to the Greens. I used to be in Vince Cable's office quite often, and then May the 10th, 2010, came along and he went into government, and I've never spoken to him since. <laughs> I don't know whether that was his choice or my choice, actually. <laughs> uh, but a couple of my policies are actually, in, as a result, in uh, the, the coalition government's own um, policy. Uh, very strangely, um, I actually have contributed to their policy review um, on tax. Sorry, it's just that... Uh, it's kind of like this kind of the first time I've ever heard about this stuff, and I'm a bit lost about right. what you just said. It sounded very important, though. What so we're doing is talking about uh, what happened was tax. It, let's go back to the point then, the key point. I was just trying to make the point I was making a part of a political point about Labour. That was interesting, though. I mean, Labour yeah. did not overspend. If you actually look, I mean, there will be an article published next week on Labour List, written by me. And admittedly, it is a contribution to the Labour Party's policy review. So, yeah, they do like me. But then I have also written policy for the Green Party as well. And it will show that simply from two, 1997 to 2007, Labour ran a surplus when you compare their total tax income 
with the total spending on current expenditure. Now, current expenditure is you know, the day-to-day -day things, running hospitals, paying benefits, paying pensions, providing for schools, paying the armed forces, and so on. They also paid for half of their investment in things like new schools and new hospitals and new roads and so on, which the government pays for, out of current tax income. They did run a, a deficit over that period overall, from 2001 to 2007, but that was entirely to pay for investment. None of it. So it was like borrowing to pay, you know, if you buy a car, not everybody pays in cash. It's a pretty reasonable thing to take out a loan to buy an asset. If you buy a house, most people, unless you call David Cameron, haven't got the cash to put down to buy it up front. You have to take a mortgage. Borrowing to pay for investment is fair enough. But if you listen to the popular narrative from now Liberal Democrats and <coughs> Conservatives, they would tell you that Labour just borrowed money willy-nilly for no purpose and it was all useless. That was simply untrue. And if you actually look back over the previous 17 years of the Tories, they borrowed a lot more for current spending than Labour did. Their record in office of actually balancing the books was much worse than Labour's from 1997. And it drives me around the bend that Ed Balls won't say what I've just said in public. Mm -hmm. Why you? I have no clue. <laughs> Did you know what it, I mean, would you know I, how to articulate it? I don't know. It drives me around the bend. So, you can... If I start very quickly, that is a percentage of GDP, presumably did go down from 97 to 2000. Is that right? Debt as a percentage of GDP fell quite significantly from 97 to 2001, right. rose slowly from 2001 to 2007, and then of course went up significantly. But one of the reasons why debt rose significantly from 2007 to 2008 was that actually, because of the absurd rules of government accounting, all the liabilities of Lloyds Bank and Royal Bank of Scotland suddenly became government debt without them being allowed to take into account any of the assets of Royal Bank of Scotland and Lloyds Bank. So they were only allowed to take into account one half of the equation, which is pretty darn stupid. Because actually you should take into consideration the risk that they might have to pay some of those bad debts, not all of them. Who said they only have to take into account? That's an EU rule, and it's agreed internationally on how you account for government <coughs> debt. It's an absurd rule. But in fairness, the Treasury does publish the figure with and without that. What happened in 2008 was, I haven't got the graph here, so I'm going to draw it for you. That line there, almost exactly, going up there, is what happened to spending from 1997 to 2012. It's risen every year. There are two reasons why it's risen. The biggest one is inflation, because we have it, and that's measured in real prices. The other one is actually there are more people demanding more services, some of whom are old. <coughs> and so, yes, we've had to spend more. Tax revenue is that slightly wavy line. From 1997 until 2001, Labour got in more tax than it paid out currently. 2001, when we had the dot-com crash, they were really worried we were going to go into recession. They started spending more to make sure we didn't go into a recession then, and they carried on until 2007. There's a good argument they should have stopped there economically. They did overspend in 2004, 5, 6, and there's probably a good argument they did overspend at that point. And that's why Ed Balls is so vulnerable on this, and he's so embarrassed about it, because it's probably true they did overspend a bit there. Not massively, but a little bit. And then what happened was, spending still carried on, the tax did that. It crashed. Because the banks crashed. And with them, economic confidence crashed, and lots of companies crashed, and we suddenly put lots of people out of work. And bank bonuses weren't paid anymore, and there's lots of PAYE on bank bonuses. And VAT fell because we had to drop the VAT rate to make sure the economy kept going so people stayed in work, and that actually cost us £15 billion in 2008. And suddenly, bank, uh, revenues, and they're still doing that. According to George Osborne, if we extended this graph, that's now going to do that. It's going to skyrocket because there's growth happening. <laughs> and he's also going to do a bit of that, so they're going to converge in 2017. The chance of that happening is... 
that <laughs> it's not going to happen. That is a very accurate graph, though, what happened. The crisis was not spending. We had had the two, and actually, overall, I haven't brought it quite accurately, that equation near enough balances over that entire period. That surplus near enough is that deficit, it's fine. No. So insignificant is neither here nor there. But from then, it all fell apart. That's why tax became interesting. That's what put the sexy into tax. Because suddenly, we haven't got it. And that's why when we came to 2009, at the April G20 summit, which was Gordon Brown's finest moment, without a shadow of a doubt, it's not a big book, but that was undoubtedly his finest moment, and frankly a very high point in Barack Obama's career, they said, we are going to tackle one major issue because we know it's causing, or helping cause this crisis. Tax havens created the opacity, the secrecy, that we didn't know the banks were going to fall over because so much of the debt was hidden on bank balance sheets. And I've been involved in trying to disclose that. In 2007, I disclosed that there was $40 billion hidden on the balance sheet of HBOS, which of course the next year completely collapsed. But nobody believed that was a problem. Nobody found it before I did. When Northern Rock went wrong in September 2007, uh, Robert Peston and I had a bit of a sort of fun uh, game because he got Northern Rock, it's fair to say. He heard about that because Peston had his inside sources at Downing Street. But Northern Rock collapsed because it had a shadow bank. Its shadow bank was called Granite. And I got Granite. Mm. And I exposed the fact that actually 40% of Northern Rock was owned by a trust in Guernsey, which was administered from Jersey for the benefit, supposedly, of the Down Syndrome Association of the Northeast of England, who didn't even know that they were the beneficiaries of £40 billion worth of assets until we told them via the Observer newspaper. Actually, Northern Rock in fairness then made them a decent donation for borrowing their name as their charitable trust. But they'd never bothered to even tell them before that. And there was this shadow bank, which was the cause of the failure, and it was offshore that had created the opacity, critical word, of you know, secrecy, inability to understand what was going on, that let this happen. 